How many of you believe that you are really God's masterpiece? I think that sometimes it's easier for us to believe that than other times. And I think we probably all have doubts about that occasionally. But we are, in fact, God's masterpiece, and we want to talk about that a little bit this morning, what it means and the responsibilities we have that come with being his masterpiece. So I want to start this morning with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Okay. And we're going to read this one from Scripture, and then we'll read a lot of other Scripture too, but we'll have that on the screen for you. So if you are able and willing to stand with me, we'll read this together. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word to us this morning. I thank you for telling us who we are from your perspective. I ask that your spirit would be present to speak to us to help us to see ourselves like you see us so that we might begin to think more like you think and become more like you are. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm not sure this is working. There we go. I think I missed one. Can you go back one, James? So, the word masterpiece is translated different words in different translations. In the NIV, it's translated handiwork. In the New King James, it's translated workmanship. But the actual word is poema, and our English word poem comes from that word. I must admit that in high school, I was not a big fan of poetry. It seemed like it was, is it my fault? <laughs> it helps to turn it on. <laughs> it seemed like the poetry was always in Old English, words that I didn't understand and concepts that I understand. And, and a lot of the poems were about love and that kind of stuff. And I was an angry kid. And love and all this relational stuff just didn't, it didn't mean anything to me. And I really kind of hated poetry in school. But as I got older, I began to realize that maybe poetry is not such a bad thing. And today, when I want to express to my beautiful wife how much I love her and how much she means to me, I want to use poetry to do that. Who would have thought? <laughs> But my, my deepest desires and feelings and emotions, I really want to express in poetry. Now, I'm not very good at it. You know, it's a, roses are red, violets are blue stuff. But in my heart, I want to use poetry. 
And I believe that when God created man and woman, his final creation, we were his crowning achievement, and we, and he wanted to use poetry to express that. And so Paul tells us that we are his poem. We are his greatest work of art, and he delights in us. And we are poetry to the world around us. We're poems of love, poems of beauty, poems of delight to the world around us. The word masterpiece then fits that perfectly. It tells us exactly what we are. But we are not masterpieces designed to be hung on a wall and admired and looked at. We are masterpieces designed for a purpose. We are poems with a purpose, poems with a meaning. And whenever we want to talk about anything in our life, Jesus is a gold standard for that. Any question you have about your life, about what Scripture says about anything, we need to look to Jesus for the answer. And so in Ephesians we read that we were created to do the good things that God has planned for us long ago. What are those good things? What is it that God wants us to be doing as his masterpieces? And we're going to look at that as we go along. Jesus is the one that explains what good works are. So in John chapter 5, we read this. John was like a burning and shining lamp. And you were excited for a while about his message. But I have a greater witness than John. My teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me. So Jesus said that his good works were his teachings and his miracles. That was what he considered to be his good works. And those good works were given to him from the Father. Jesus said, at my Father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one of these are you going to stone me? Everything Jesus did was done at the direction of his Father. He did not do anything on his own. He did er everything according to what his Father said. Yesterday morning, I had breakfast with a godly man. <clears throat> and he told me that when he goes to church, he doesn't always sit in the same place. But rather, when he gets to church, he asks God where God wants him to sit so that he might be in the right place to be able to minister to somebody around him. And I thought, huh, what a great idea. And then I thought, when I go to church, I always sit at the same place. In fact, <laughs> I actually heard somebody say one time, that's Gary and Vicky's table. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> what, what do you mean that's our table? <sighs> so I wonder what it would look like. If we really started asking God about everything we do, even the little things about where we sit when we go to church. Now, I'm not asking all of you to do that. I'm, I could probably look out here and make a mental note of where you're all sitting and you'll all be somewhere else next week. <laughs> I'm, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just asking you to think about 
asking God about everything in your life that you're going to do. That's what Jesus did. Every single thing that he did, he got direction from his Father, and especially the good works that he did. The good works that he did were serving others. The miracles that he did were for the benefit of other people. The things that he taught were the benefit of other people. The good things that he did consisted in serving other people. He said, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life a ransom for many. So the good works that he did, the teachings and the miracles were designed to be serving others. And if we're going to be like Jesus, our good works will be the same. We could say that we are the most poetic when we serve other people. Your poem is the most expressive and the most beautiful and the most meaningful when you are in the process of serving other people. So we read that our Father planned good works for us to do long ago in Ephesians 2.10. We don't need to read that again. But what are the good things that God wants you to be doing? Jesus had good things that God wanted him to do. What are the good, good things that God wants you to be doing? In 1 Peter 2.10, it says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. God has gifted you to do the good works that he wants you to do. He already has a plan for you to do those good works, and he has given you the gifts to be able to do them. Do you know what those gifts are? Have you thought about the gifts that God has given you? And how do we even know what those gifts are? If Jesus is the one we look to for any question we have, then he's the one we need to look to to find out what the gifts are that God has given us and the good things that he wants us to do. So in John chapter 13... Just before Passover, when Jesus was at the table with the disciples, he did this. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel he had around him. No, I'm not asking you to wash somebody's feet this morning. That's not on the agenda. What I am asking you to do is to know what Jesus knew that enabled him to do that. The act of washing another person's feet in those days was the act of supreme servanthood. If they'd had a dictionary, if Webster's Dictionary was there and you looked in that dictionary and you looked up serve, you would have seen a picture of somebody washing another person's feet. That was a supreme example of serving someone else. The only people that did that were servants. No one else washed somebody's feet. If you did that, everyone knew you were a servant and you were low on the totem pole. Jesus did that to show his disciples what he wanted them to do. But there's three things that he knew that enabled him to do that. First of all, he knew that his father gave to him all things. 
put all, the uh, NLT says that he had all authority. The literal reading of that is his father gave to him and to his hands all things. It's a picture of giving and receiving. It's like the father said, Jesus, I have some things that I want to give you. And Jesus held out his hands to receive those things. So it's not just the father giving them, it is Jesus receiving them at the same time. What has God given you? And have you actually received whatever it is? For many people, they're not really sure what God has given them. What gifts has God given you that enable you to serve other people? Because we can only give what we have received. If I haven't received it, I can't give it. So what have you received? I remember when I first became committed to Christ and I decided that whatever he wanted me to do, I would do it. But the problem was, I didn't know what he wanted me to do. I had no clue. I didn't, I didn't have any experience in Christianity. I didn't really know Jesus very well. <laughs> the only stuff I knew how to do was have a good party. And, and that's not serving other people. And what happened is that people began to talk to me about things they saw in me. Because they saw things in me that I did not see myself. And somebody would kind of come up and say, Gary, you should teach a Sunday school class. I say, you're nuts. <laughs> I can't do that. I don't know anything about doing that. And they, they would say, Gary, you should lead, lead us in this prayer meeting. And I would say, oh, come on. I can't do that. But they saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Something that God had gifted me with. The ability to, to teach and to lead people. That was totally foreign to me. And I didn't see it at all. As they would tell me these things, I'd think about them. And I'd even talk to Vicky about them. And I'd say, you know what somebody said today? Can you, that's crazy talk. Guess what? <laughs> it wasn't crazy talk. God has, was given me those gifts, and I didn't even know it yet. So how do we find out what gifts God has given you? What's the process you go through? You begin to listen to other people. You begin to seek God himself and ask God that question. At the end of every service at Oasis, we receive a blessing and we put our hands out to receive that. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that you put your hands out before God and say, God, I want to receive the gifts that you've given me. I want them in my life so that I can use them to serve other people. If he's given you a gift, he wants you to know it. He wants you to know what those gifts are. And he will be glad to tell you what those gifts are. The second thing Jesus knew is that he came from heaven. Jesus came from a perfect place. He was praised, he was worshiped, no sin, everything that, everything perfect. And he came to a world that was filled with sin. A world that was evil, a world that, where he would not be worshipped anymore, a world where he would be ridiculed and laughed at and persecuted. But he knew where he came from. He knew that he was God. Even though he was 100% man, he was also 100% God, and he knew that. He was secure in where he came from. And that enabled him to do the work that God asked him to do here. 
He knew that what he did did not affect his identity. It didn't affect his past. It didn't affect where he came from. He knew who he was. He knew where he came from. <laughs> Where'd you come from? <laughs> not from heaven. None of us came from heaven. We came from a place of sin. A place of being enemies with God. We came from, we were people who had no desire to know God. We wanted what we wanted and that was it. But in the midst of that, God chose you. He said, I want you to be my child. I'm going to adopt you. I'm going to make you one of my beloved children. And that's who you are today. If you believe in Jesus, you are one of God's masterpieces. One of his creation, one of those glorious people that God has chosen and loved and made special. We don't always feel like that, do we? Boy, there's lots of times when I don't feel special. And sometimes all it takes is a negative comment from somebody else to make me feel very unspecial. But God says that we are his special creation, chosen and loved by him. That means that if we have our identity intact, we'll be able to serve him. And the final thing that Jesus knew was that he was going back to heaven. And this might be maybe the most important thing that we need to know. Where are you going? Where are you headed? Do you know that if you were to die today that you would absolutely 100% go to heaven to be with Jesus? You should know that because God tells you that. There's absolutely no doubt that if you believe in Jesus and you're a child of God, you will be in heaven with him. But you know, I talk to a lot of people that just aren't quite sure about that. And I ask that question often. If you died today, how confident are you that you would go to heaven? And it's sad to say that probably the majority of people I talk to are like 80 to 90% sure. <laughs> Why is that? Because we do not really know who we are. And we think that God's acceptance of us is based on our performance. And it absolutely is not. Your eternal destination is not based on you at all. It's based on the promises of God. And I find that when people come to believe that they are 100% secure and they know 100% that they're going to heaven if they die, or when they die, they have so much freedom. It just changes everything regarding their outlook in life. So I'm gonna encourage you, if you don't know for sure where you will go when you die, come talk to me. I would love to help you understand the truth of that so that you know for sure where you're going when you die. Jesus set the example for us to follow. And I want to look at the verses following where he washed their feet. Because this is where Jesus explained to them exactly why he did what he did. He says, it says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? 
You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. Because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I do. Whoops. <laughs> I don't think we want a worship leader. Can you help me, James? <laughs> I'll read it. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is a messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. The whole point of doing this was to set an example for us in how to serve other people. You have a place of honor before God. God honors you. He's chosen you. He's put you at the head. But that doesn't mean that you sit there and wait for other people to serve you. That doesn't mean that you ask other people to wash your feet. It doesn't mean that you expect other people to do things for you. It means that you take the initiative in serving others. That you get up from the head of the table and you go and you serve people who are less than you. People who need to be served. The disciples needed their feet washed. There was no servant there to do it. Jesus chose to be that servant so he could do it. We are the most beautiful poem in the world when we are serving other people. We are fulfilling the meaning of our poetry. We are being the, who God wants us to be when we become like Jesus and serve other people. Are you secure in who you are? Do you know what God's given you? Do you know where you came from? Do you know where you're going? These are questions that usually teenagers ask about themselves. We get to a certain age in life and we start wondering, what am I here for? What am I supposed to do? What's my purpose? How can I, make, how can I have an impact, have some significance? And for many of us, we never get those questions answered. We still are a little hazy in exactly what it is that God wants us to do. God wants you to know for sure who you are. He wants you to know what he's given you, and he wants you to know where you're going to. And he will tell you that if you will ask him. I was reading an article this last week by a guy named Paul Tripp. And the title of the article was The Biggest Threat to Christianity in 2023. A lot of different ideas about that. But I truly believe that for believers, what he said was correct. And he said the biggest problem is what he calls identity amnesia. We forget who we are. Maybe we never knew who we were. But the key to being able to serve other people and be the poem that God wants us to be is found in our identity, knowing who we are. And you know, this isn't a new problem. Throughout the New Testament, we see this, this issue over and over again. Every author of a New Testament book 
talked about in some form or another who we are in Jesus. They, they, each one of them gave us a different picture of what our identity looks like. Peter was one of them that wrote about that a lot. And I can tell you that in, the, in 1 Peter chapter 2, just in that one chapter, there are more than 10 identity statements about who we are. Have you ever read scripture with a view to seeing what it says about who you are? We read scripture to find out about Jesus and who he is, but we also need to read it to find out about who we are. I'm going to challenge you to, to read 1 Peter chapter 2. And find out how many identity statements you see there. What does it say about you as a child of God? What is God saying about who you are? And then begin to read other parts of Scripture, and especially the New Testament, and, and start seeing the picture of who God says you are. <laughs> Masterpiece? Are you? Really? Yes, absolutely. Poetic? Of course. God's poem for people to see and to read and to look at and to enjoy? Yes. And so much more than that. Other scriptures, there's one that talks about us being the fragrance of Christ. People can smell us <laughs> in a good way. So many pictures that we have of who we are in Jesus. Truly believing those pictures will enable us to be the poetry that God designed us to be. The only thing required of you is that you choose to believe it. And sometimes that's hard. In the book of James, it says that if we lack wisdom, we can ask God and he'll give it to us. We're looking for wisdom about who we are in Christ. And James goes on to say that we must believe what God tells us. Because if we doubt, we're like the waves of the sea that are tossed all about, and we're unstable. I talk to a lot of people that are just kind of unstable. They're tossed about, they're back and forth, and they're just, they're not sure of what's happening in their life, and, and, there's, and they have trouble finding stability. Stability comes from choosing to believe what God tells you about him and about yourself. You can choose to believe whatever is true. It's a choice. I'm going to ask you to choose to believe today that you are, in fact, God's masterpiece. And you may have to make that choice ten times in a day. You may have to keep reminding yourself over and over, I am God's masterpiece. I am God's poem. I am God's beautiful gift to this world. Choose to do that. Choose to believe it. And become the servant that God designed you to be. Let's pray. Father, you have clearly told us who we are. You have clearly told us where we came from, where we're going to, and that you have given us gifts that enable us to serve others. I ask that you will 
Enable us to see ourselves like you see us. And to fully and completely embrace that picture. And as we do so, that we would have the freedom to move into other people's lives, serving them as they need served, not being concerned about ourselves, but truly being able to be concerned about serving others in the same way that Jesus did. And I pray in Jesus' name.